begin. All right. Well, um, tonight I will be talking about atmospheric to electric firing. So I'm kind of doing the opposite of Anne Marie right now. <laughs> and um, I'm currently based out of the rock, technically Rocky Hill, but essentially Hartford area in Connecticut. And I'm still kind of setting up my studio and I'm currently um, working on making that transition to electric fired pots. And um, I would say probably my preference is soda firing, but since I left working in academia, I haven't had access to soda kiln. So this is actually a picture here of Amy's kiln um, on the because she was one of my big people. I would gypsy or gypsy wood fire traveling um, wood fire potter um, part of different crews. And um, so here are some examples of wood fired pots on the left and soda fired pot on the right. Um, on the left hand side, I, the lower ones are have flashing slips on them. And the top one um, was with glaze. So I kind of got to a point where I was doing a mix. So I really had glazes and slips kind of ready to go for jumping back and forth either direction. Cause when I was working in academia, I did do both of them regularly. And um, the last few years I have been mostly moving a lot and getting studios set up and um, doing a lot of home renovating. Like we've done a lot of work on our current house as well. Um, but I do miss my window in Milwaukee <laughs> and I miss being near Amy so I could be on her crew there. Um, but before that, um, I was working in academia as a ceramic technician, professor, gallery director. I had a lot of roles there for the time I was there. And we also built a lot of kilns while we were there too. And, um, but like I said, my primary if goal was soda firing and getting nerdy now about firing schedules, clay bodies. So here's one that's really reduced on the left and more oxidized on the right. So why I'm getting ready for these changes, um, I mean, we're kind of a little bit past the pandemic and isolating, but for a year there, it was kind of tricky um, with COVID trying to do group um, wood firings. And then because of the pandemic, my husband ended up needing to switch jobs and we did the cross country move from Milwaukee um, here to Connecticut. And um, so I no longer, while well, I probably could find new crews to be part of, the, my newer reality is that I am newer mom. I now have a, can't believe it, she's walking, but a little over a one-year-old. Um, so now I'm doing the whole full-time mom thing. My baby now toddler is finally starting to sleep. So I'm finally seeing, starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel of um, being able to make pots again. And um, so I'm kind of just like, like I said, really just going through this the beginnings of the switch to electric firing. And I'm talking to myself about, all right, the positives are I don't have to depend on others. Oh, don't think about missing the community. Um, the positive are I have control over the surface. Oh, but don't think about how I used to decorate the pot with the kiln. <laughs> positive is I have the kiln at the house. Positive is it's not going to be as harsh on the pottery, so I could make maybe totally different types of forms. Like they don't have to necessarily have curves. Um, downside is is I don't have my fifteen years worth of research and atmospheric firing to draw on. And I have to say, like it's really hard letting go of this identity as an atmospheric potter. Um, by the way. If you're asking questions, I'll address them at the end because all I see is my slideshow. <laughs> um, so it's really tough to make this switch. Like atmospheric power, you frequently you're doing group firings and you gain this built-in feedback. Um, and like I said, I had my whole aesthetic wrapped around this decorating the pot with the kiln and. And in addition to being like this identity switch from atmospheric to non-atmospheric potter, is I'm also making this switch of being a full-time mom and 
new priorities there. So there's just a lot going on right now, but it's also really exciting um, for new stuff. Um, so I kind of had a lot of fun um, making this slideshow and just thinking about how I've really worked in the past um, developing ideas. And I'm gonna kind of go into with pictures, all these different sections, mentors, sketchbook, working in series, sources of inspiration, testing. And I would have to say probably the most influential has always been uh, mentors. And that's probably come primarily come through college. Um, so my undergrad was at Houghton College. And while I was there, I made a big switch from being a 2D artist. So this is like a painting I did of horses. I could also say I made a big identity shift from being a horse person to an art person. And um, here is um, the work of my mentor, Catherine White on the left-hand side. And this is work I was making on the right-hand side at Hood College. Um, so you can see like my work made very different changes, based on working, I would say working with these mentors. Um, Kevin Crow on the left, and then I I then made a huge switch as well because this was very hand-built to then going to strictly wheel thrown. And when you do an apprenticeship, it's very hard not to mimic your mentor because let's just be honest, Kevin Crow makes some really gorgeous pots. And so I made another huge shift. Um, Really the next big shift in my work came from doing this art residency in China and the porcelain was so nasty to work with. <laughs> that I, I did essentially what Amy did of making really huge um, pots and then carving them down. So now I've just been addicted to the sure form ever since that art residency there. And um, people frequently ask me where my circle tattoo design came from. It was actually this teapot here. Um, and this is also the, um, when I started incorporating um, wax resist designs and not just having kind of the typical plain um, wood fire pot. And then I would say probably my last really huge mentor in my life was Helen Otterson. And she really encouraged me to test mixing in other materials such as wood and glass and I continue to regularly work with wood and then here is uh, some hand-built plates that I did in my time in Germany and these were electric fired and it kind of really gave me a hope that I could actually make some electric fired pots that I would like that were very different from work I've made in the past. So the next kind of big thing for developing ideas is using sketchbooks. And I have to admit, I come and go with working with this. So currently in my studio, I had this idea of really wanting to make a tray with a soup bowl and a handle, but I've never made a soup bowl and a handle. So I was just kind of quickly just on a scrap of paper, drawing out some ideas versus other times like I really this was back in grad school wanted to make this uh, wooden clay set but I'd never mixed the two together and um, so this was kind of a more drawn out how I envisioned the piece looking like originally and I frequently use um, I don't know what you call it, stream of conscious writing in journaling in addition to the sketchbook drawing um, so on the bottom is how the piece actually turned out looking. And then <clears throat> I'm not always good about doing this, but I really like taking notes on pieces I've made. Um, so I'll take notes on like how to make this again, because sometimes I'll visit a form and then not come back to making that type of form for a year or so, or maybe it's notes about the design work on the piece. So this is like another approach. And I frequently learn a lot when I actually sit down, and draw a piece and kind of write about it. Um, but I would say my usual go-to for developing ideas is working in series. So usually it's unlike when I've worked with those different mentors where I had major shifts in the way the work looked, um, usually it's been more subtle 
So for instance, here's a series of, you know what? I really want to do some cutouts. I've never made an onion or garlic jar. And then hmm, what else could I make with cutouts? And so I started making berry bowls and fruit colander bowls and vases. And I still don't think that vase form is like, that's like one, ooh, I really want to go farther with cutouts and vases. Um, so I'm excited to eventually come back to that. Um, a series could be even the surface design work. Here's just lines, here's just circles. I'm gonna take it farther. What if I do arches and rectangles? So that's another approach to working in series. Um, and then I think the next one, and this one's kind of more subtle, is trying to figure out what inspires the aesthetic behind your work. And I would have to say one of the biggest things for me is aged objects. So the whole top row is like texture shots of man-made things. So whether that's be rusting iron or peeling paint on furniture or outside buildings or eight old buildings. And then the lower row is all aging things in nature, aging leaves, mushrooms, melting ice and aging plants. So I would say that's always been a really huge thing for me and kind of my aesthetic. Um, and I would say <clears throat> textile designs. I worked in Tanzania and briefly in Guatemala as well. Um, I would say more so Tanzania. They did a lot of batik fabrics with the wax resist designs. <clears throat> but um, I guess one thing I'm excited about or questioning is like, hmm, I like am really inspired by textiles I saw in these places that I worked. Maybe I do need to make myself use color. Um, I would say use is a huge inspiration. That's usually more informative about the form of the piece, not necessarily the look of the piece. Like, does it function well? For instance, like, I love these tall skinny vases for gladiolas and kind of really nerding out about flowers, but you know, short, wide, heavy vases allow you to kind of go crazy with the wildflowers and that sort of thing. Um, but like I said, in the past nature and traveling um, has really excited me and it's been really fun to actually start taking my pots with me on these hikes and be like, oh yeah, these totally align my love of nature and travel and look how good these pots look out in nature. So then I'm like, oh, do I really want to go colorful? Maybe I just need to go visit more gardens rather than just the rocky hiking trails. <clears throat> and then I would say another thing of big inspiration is artists like I would say Linda Christensen in the past has really been a big influence I just have always loved her boxy square forms right now I'm just loving seeing Jen Allen's updates about pushing from our very pristine porcelain to working with a red clay that's slab built rather than thrown so that's something that's kind of really exciting to watch right now and I think I'm kind of coming to, hmm, what if I really changed up what one of my sources of inspiration were? What if I really love the like bohemian styles and color palette of tans and greens? And um, it's kind of sometimes I use the primitive textiles in there too. Like what if I, I don't want to say imitate, but borrow from that a little bit more. Um, another thing I've been pondering, hmm, what if I went back to revisiting some of these more um, rock inspired on the verge of like sculptural wood clay pieces. And once upon a time I'd done this vase set and it made me think of my hike through some slot canyons and like, hmm, do I want to go more rugged with my pieces than just a sure form, but switch to more of hand building and a lot of ponderings there. So reality is, is I'm more so at the material testing. So right now I'm playing with porcelain. I could play with, Denise actually has some ideas about playing with some slips. Um, I'm definitely playing with testing glazes. Um, I'm definitely been playing with adding wood to set some ceramic sets. 
Um, here's some glaze test. These are actually Amico glazes because I was kind of at a place where I'm not really sure what I want to make for glazes. So I'm just going to buy some pre-made glazes so I, until I build up my chemistry lab or whatever you want to call it to mix my own glazes. It's quite an adjustment to not having the university's um, glaze lab to work from. So here's some tests of colorful pieces. And these are some tests I've recently done that are more earth tone. So um, I, I didn't write, I don't have feature in this um, picture is what the base glaze was, but the Amico um, glaze next to it is what the top layer is. Um, so I kind of got excited about, hmm, maybe I don't have to go colorful. I'm even testing going back to some hand building. I um, showed that one piece next to Catherine White of, I called it this line and use series. And so I would throw pieces and then slab build with them. Um, but I've also been curious of grabbing some scraps of wood from my wood shop, which I have next to my ceramic studio and hand building. So. I'm kind of really thinking I might go back to more hand building, but I don't really know what that's going to look like yet. Um, I've been testing surface decorations. So this is some um, Mishima going on in this piece. Um, so yeah, I'm, I have a lot of options in my near future. And I, I hope sharing this slideshow has maybe given you some inspiration of maybe changing things up as I'm just in the beginning journey of it all. And I think, I think that's my slideshow. So now I'm gonna go back to the Zoom screen where I can see if anyone wrote questions. So let me do the stop share and then whew, there's everyone back on Zoom. All right, well, that was awesome, Lisa. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I could show my video now too again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, I'm excited to see all the possibilities um, that you have in front of you, and I, I think that um, you're very, you really consider your methods well. A lot of people just kind of, well, let's just see what happens, you know. And it seems like you have like a lot of, um, a lot of. Um, tools in your toolbox for your approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that will de definitely help you a lot as opposed to just kind of, you know, spaghetti on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's definitely some spaghetti on the wall going on, but <laughs> that's just your child. <laughs> <laughs> you can only blame your daughter for that, but um... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was very refreshing to make the slideshow and be like, all right, all right. I've done changes before in the past. It's just been a little while since I've made the same kind of work for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. And I, I, you know, I'm excited to see like where, where this leads. And I'm also excited that, you know, you're close enough to potentially come fire with me sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does that have to be the end end? <laughs> right? <laughs> Later, once, uh, once we get it all together. But uh, yeah. yeah. Does anybody have questions for Lisa about her, uh, her former work or all the awesome places she's been and things she's done and uh, kind of the evolution of, of her aesthetic? I'm just impressed by all the places you've been. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've hopped where, around a lot. <laughs> where are you now? I'm actually visiting family in North Carolina right this instant, but I'm in Hartford, okay. Connecticut, or rather Rocky okay. Hill. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually really like Connecticut, but I definitely miss Milwaukee in the Midwest. I haven't met the clay community out there yet, mostly because I've done a lot of isolating with being pregnant and then having my young child, but you know, things are looking a lot brighter now. So I need to start getting out and meeting, meeting people. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. It's exciting. And, you know, I mean, I don't know if there are any studios nearby, but sometimes just touching base with other people who are working in clay just to, 
get ideas and and see what they're working in can spur all kinds of things too. Mentor mentor doesn't have to be somebody um, you know with more experience than you necessarily. It could just mm-hmm. be somebody who inspires you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then I've I've told you this before, but just embracing the phase too, like it's gonna yeah. go so freaking fast. <laughs> so right, Amy and I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I survived the first year. Yes. <laughs> best worst year of my life (laughs) I'm a person who loves sleep so the whole no sleep thing looks rough (laughs) I know you can relate to that Amy (laughs) yeah I love my sleep so much and when Reed woke up you know at 5 a.m for like four years that was that was not okay (laughs) oh dear (laughs) I'll tell her that. <laughs> no, you just train them to like stay in their room. It's fine. <laughs> Eventually, you just put juice boxes on the bottom shelf of the refrigerator and leave little cereal, you know, little single use cereal containers where they can reach them. It's, it's good. <laughs> Teach independence, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really cool to see your body of work from years ago to to the experimentation that's going on now. And I'm so proud of you and I miss you so much. I miss you too, Amy. (laughs) Amory, give her a hug for me. (laughs) It's from Lisa. (laughs) Thank you. Was was that maple making a fuss? Oh, I'm at they actually have some laundry going on. I, I heard a dog barking. Dogs, like, that's me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there are four dogs in the house here right now, so there is a potential. Okay. I didn't notice it too. Yeah, as long as uh, no one's waking up, Maple. <laughs> well, Lisa, I appreciate you uh, joining us and uh, doing your slideshow and talking about your aesthetic. Were there any other questions about Lisa's? quest for the uh the, the great uh electric boogie boogaloo what do we want to call it <laughs> there's 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 a, there's a phrase there somewhere about electric something that that'll be uh that you can like hang your hat on and uh and play with it'll be good well if you share the recording remember there's still two more lectures tomorrow or not lectures per se, but talks.